submarines brought from the decks of our carriers, army bombers, marines, thundered destruction over a 300-mile battle area. Hello, viewers, and welcome back to another episode of The Model Guy, History and Scale. In this episode, we're going to be touching on the F4F Wildcat and its service in the United States Navy slash Marine Corps, and also in the Royal Navy Fleet Air Arm. The F4F Wildcat entered service with the Royal Navy Fleet Air Arm in 1940 and was known as the Martlet prior to entering service with the U.S. Navy. Fleet Air Arm Martlets were also the first American-made aircraft to shoot down an enemy aircraft on Christmas Day in 1940. The reason that the Wildcat slash Martlet was so important to the Royal Navy was that the Royal Navy didn't have their own fighter that could keep up with the modern aircraft at the start of the war. The Sea Fire and the Sea Hurricane were never designed to work on a carrier and were just happened to fill the gap until something better would come along. One of the first significant contributions of the Martlet for the Royal Navy was when six of them were sent on convoy duty with an escort carrier in September of 1941. These Wildcats shot down several Falkwith Condor recon aircraft, and they were the first Wildcats, quote-unquote, to engage in combat from a carrier. During the course of the war, 1,200 Wildcats would go on to serve with the fleet air arm, considered superior for small carrier operations for escort duties in the Atlantic, and these Wildcats also served until the war's end. The last victory for the Wildcat was in March of 1945, when four BF-109s were shot down over no Norway by fleet air arm Wildcats. Entering United States Navy service in 1940, the Wildcat was at center stage for fighting during the Battle of the Coral Sea. Notably, the first carrier versus carrier action in history, with each side's ships not directly sighting or engaging each other. The entire campaign was fought with carrier aircraft alone. And after this campaign, it was confirmed that it was no longer the battleship that ruled the oceans. Power was now projected by carrier aircraft. Although the Wildcat was considered bested performance-wise by the faster and more maneuverable Zero, its hitting power and rugged durability gave it a fighting chance against the smaller and more nimble aircraft. Teamwork became the name of the game as John Thatch developed a new tactic to help the Americans counter the Zero. By flying in pairs, the U.S. pilots were able to defend each other as the targeted Wildcat led the attacking Japanese Zero in front of their wingman. Thatch solidified it in action during the Battle of Midway when his wingman was bounced by a Zero, and the wingman immediately led it into Thatch's machine guns. The Zero was destroyed, and the maneuver became a United States Navy standard tactic. Even the U.S. Army Air Force adopted it, and in fact, it worked so well, it was used during the Vietnam War and is still taught today to fighter pilots. Even though the Wildcat was considered inferior to the Japanese Zero, it did hold its own during the first year of the war as the U.S. Navy's only available fighter, and it wasn't until 1943, with the arrival of the Grumman Hellcat, the Wildcat's bigger brother, and the Corsair, did the American Navy finally have a fighter superior in performance to the Mitsubishi Zero. The F-4F Wildcat holds a special place for me because it was the first World War II aircraft I actually got to see fly in person at the Shearwater International Air Show. It really stuck with me with how small the plane actually was, but what stuck with me the most was the sound of the engine as Greg Shelton put his Wilder Wildcat through a fully aerobatic performance. It wasn't a flyby or a fly pass. He took this Wildcat right to the edge with rolls, loops, and had the aircraft down at 10 feet off the ground at its top speed. The aircraft itself was greasy, beat up, but you go to the flight line after and before his show and touch it and see a living history. If you're wondering why a guy that likes to build models also likes to talk about history so much, I should mention at this point that as a kid, as five years old, I started becoming interested in history and aviation. My grandfather let me watch the Battle of Britain movie, and that had a huge impact immediately because it was noisy, it was fast planes, and it was exciting to watch. I should watch other movies with my grandfather as well, like Midway, Tora Tora Tora, The Great Escape, Bridge Over the Ridger Kwai, and we usually had the History Channel on Sunday afternoons and myself Saturday night to watch History on Film with Anne Medina. It was always entertaining. Most Canadians will know that show that have ever watched the History Channel back when it was actually the History Channel and not about Pawn Stars or other weird stuff like Ancient Aliens. There was no Netflix or YouTube for documentaries to be readily available, so when the classics were on TV, it was great, or it was sitting down and reading books. 
If you're wondering what my qualification is to be talking about history, it's simply that. It's from books and the knowledge over the years reading, over the last 30 years almost. In the last five years alone, according to my library card, I've saved over $6,000 on books I've taken out from the library reading about history. So now you can understand why, even now as an adult, when I hear a radial engine start up and start coughing at an air show, why it's so special and engaging to actually see that in person. All the Hollywood special effects in the world won't do anything compared to it. Now onto the model build. I've ranted long enough about history and the actual aircraft. You'll notice here I'm using a stencil for the first time in one of my builds as it's been readily available for this whole thing and I really wanted to try to weather this aircraft as much as possible and still have it believable. By using this stencil it's going to give me some random patches that I can lay out over the base paint and then I can also come in and further feather it with another light light layer. Once I have all that weathering down and all the contrast I want, I'll start to cover it up with a highly thinned base color again just to tone it back. If I want a heavily weathered aircraft, I'll only add a few layers to tone it down. If I want a more clean aircraft, I'll put a few extra layers down until I like the tone that's showing. The Grumman Ironworks success story didn't stop at just the Wildcat and the Hellcat. They also went on to design the Avenger torpedo bomber during World War II, and also considering they've developed since then the E-2 Hawkeye, the C-2 Greyhound, the F-14 Tomcat, the A-6 Intruder. They've also worked with the Prowler to develop that when it was still in service, and one of my personal favorites, the S-2 Tracker. But we're definitely off topic at this point, so the Tracker will have to wait for another build video. This is the first Hobby Boss kit that I've purchased, and I was actually impressed, especially that I've only spent $20 on it. I found it on Amazon for a Prime deal and ordered it because I had seen a few other modelers on YouTube building the kit. For the price of this kit, you're actually getting quite a lot of detail. The cockpit's pretty good, but what will really blow you away is the amount of detail that's in the engine and the wheel bay. With just a few pieces of wire or soldering, you can actually have that engine look like something that's come out of an $80 or $90 kit. But while you're busy in that wheel bay, make sure you're test fitting all of your linkages first because it's very easy to misread the instructions as they are not 100% clear on how those pieces go together. I found myself on the Google a few times just to reference some photos of the actual aircraft to make sure I wasn't getting anything wrong. By priming the cockpit with the Mr. Color Silver and painting on top of it, instead of having to use a chipping fluid, I was able to easily scratch away the paint with a toothpick to give that worn and torn up look. Originally, I also wanted to motorize this model kit and had the wiring and motor in place and everything was working, but at the very end of the build, when I put the propeller in place, the tolerances were so tight with the paint that I could not get it to spin properly. Even after cleaning it and drilling it out just a tiny, tiny bit, it still would not spin properly. And rather than risk damage the model that it was finished, I decided just to cut the wiring and take that loss. But having already tried it, you can definitely count on seeing it in another video. I was able to successfully motorize a 172 BF109 last year, and you can see that on my Facebook page. Speaking of having fit issues, this kit, although it looks great for $20, you can't expect it to be a flawless build. You are going to find that the model has some errors where parts are not going to fit properly and alignment is going to be an issue and you're going to find yourself sanding quite a bit. And one of the worst areas on this kit I found for that was when I tried mating the lower part of the cockpit tub to the sides of the fuselage. There's quite a gap and step on the side that had to be sanded out and filled and where it's based just makes it a very difficult area to clean up. One thing that I really found disappointing on this kit was when I put the cockpit in place only to find that it doesn't actually sit properly behind the screen. I originally wanted to pose the cockpit open, that way you could see the interior, but the problem is this canopy with this kit doesn't fit. Even to put it behind the windscreen, it drops down almost a full millimeter behind the screen and just almost ruins that clean line on the back of the Wildcat. I had built this model as part of a group build, so I didn't want to waste time waiting for a replacement canopy or even to spend more money on replacement parts for a kit that I only spent $20 on. That didn't make any sense to me. With all the panel lines that got nuked during cleanup, it was quite a chore to come back in and re-rivet everything by hand, as these rivets don't follow a standard 
pattern that you can just use a Rosu the Riveter tool for. So I actually had to come in with a scribe tool and do each one individually. My favorite part of this kit, and something that I really enjoyed on this build, was coming in to weather it. Being a naval-based aircraft in the Pacific, in some very harsh conditions, I was able to come in and really go to town and experiment with the weathering. As you can see here, I did the normal black basing I've been doing, but I also did some post-basing, if you want to call it that, on top. I'm not sure what the term is, but by basically having my main color down, I came in and did the same thing again with lighter and then darker spatter marks just to add more depth to that paint. And one resource material that I had on hand that I really enjoyed is a book I picked up called A Storm of Eagles. And it has some great reference photos in the book and some fantastic color photos in the back. One of my favorites of a Corsair taxiing out that just really shows the harsh conditions that these aircraft had to endure and still be able to fly and fight. During painting of this model though, I did make a huge mistake and after all this work, pre-shading, post-shading, black basing and all that fun stuff, I realized that I used the wrong color on the bottom of the aircraft. And instead of using a light gall gray, I ended up using a light gray which is really dark and I didn't notice it until I started putting the blue down. So I had to come in and repaint the entire bottom of the aircraft just to correct that. And while we're on the topic of things that had to be corrected, I also had to come back and rescribe a line on my oil access door on the nose because I'd somehow completely missed that I didn't rescribe one of the lines. And it wasn't pointed out until the painting had been completely done on the aircraft. So you can imagine my pucker factor was pretty high when I was coming back and to correct that. One of the things I can be proud of with this kit is that I didn't just settle for that and say, oh well, but I actually went back and corrected it instead of letting it just go out the door as is. Because the early war markings on the Wildcat were so simple and there's no other real markings on the aircraft, I decided to fully paint it using my wife's Cricut machine to design the masks. Instead of using an insignia white, I actually went with buff and insignia white mixed together just to have a little bit off tone and unworn look on the paint. At the end of this video, I have a picture of this Wildcat and the Corsair I built last year in Marine Corps colors, and you can tell me which one you prefer, the decals or the actual painted on markings. I can tell you though, the best part about painting on the markings is that you don't have to worry about getting a decal to sit in the panel lines or over rivets. It's definitely a lot more work, but the payoff is worth it. What would be awesome for you viewers to do now is to take a moment and in the comment section below, state what's something that you challenged yourself to try on a model and how it worked out for you. Did you try painting on markings? Or maybe you tried a different type of painting or weathering. Let us know what you did, how you did it, and how it worked out in the end. I know I've said now in a few videos, and I'll say it again, is that you should always be trying to challenge yourself when it comes to model building, especially if you want to grow or improve. I see a lot of people write comments on other channels to people saying, man, I wish I could paint like you, or dude, I wish my builds turned out like yours. But the thing is, all of these people building those fantastic models all started out somewheres and I guarantee you that they got to where they are now by challenging themselves, failing, and then trying again. I don't think there's too many people in the world that have tried something new and been great at it right out of the gates. The Battle of Midway has been one of my favorite campaigns to study because it's one of those campaigns that the Japanese entered it with this great plan of how they were going to draw in the American carriers and sink them and finally have the superiority in the Pacific that they wanted. But they didn't know that the Americans had already cracked the codes and knew what their exact plans were. So on top of that, you basically have two carrier groups getting into a gunfight in a bar. They're trying to see each other first and hit each other first. And what it comes down to, who is going to be more accurate and be able to follow through with big hitting blows at the end of the day. And at the end of the day, it was the Americans. And because the Americans had delivered such a decisive blow against the Japanese, the Japanese Navy was never able to recover the pilots or the aircraft they lost during the battle. For the rest of the war, they lacked the experience that the Br Americans and the British were able to bring to all the fights. And that led to another campaign of the Marianas turkey shoot, and that's self-explanatory in the title 
the Americans just destroyed the Japanese during that battle, mostly because the Japanese pilots didn't have the experience to stand their ground. Even today, countries that want carriers is tying in directly to the lessons learned at Midway and the World War II Battle of the Pacific is that you need to have an aircraft carrier or carriers and multiple aircraft in order to project to your power a destroyer or a battleship or a frigate. They're defensive. They can't have the same amount of hitting power as a carrier can. So you're not able to have that show of force. At the end of World War II, the British and American navies showed their force by launching carrier raids against the Japanese homelands, and there was not much that the Japanese could do to stop them. Admiral Yamamoto said after Pearl Harbor that all they had done was awaken a sleeping giant, and by 1945, that sleeping giant was at Tokyo's door. Although the Wildcat was outdated by 1945 and wasn't striking at the Japanese homeland, it did have a decisive role in World War II by standing the line at Midway, Wake Island, Guadalcanal, and the Coral Sea, and giving the pilots the experience to take back to America and train other pilots and further develop aircraft to fight back against the Japanese. If you've enjoyed this build and this video, as always, please click the like button and subscribe on the links below. If not, leave a comment in the comment section and let me know why you didn't enjoy it. I would like to just take a moment and apologize to the viewers for the delay in content on this channel. October was a super busy month. I was repairing the computer and trying to clean it up a little bit and I accidentally wiped my footage for the Mustang I was building. Fear not though, I am working on something interesting for my next video and I am actually doing a kit bash of a Tamiya Mark V Spitfire and an Airfix Mark VII Seafire to build a accurate Royal Canadian Navy Seafire as it would have been on the Magnificent. So I hope you're excited for that. This is the model guy closing out and I hope you've enjoyed the video. Have a good day.